Hi. 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 Oh my God, I'm so excited, you guys. Uh, we're going to talk about our feelings now. How do we feel about it? Everybody good with that? We're going to have a little group therapy. Um, imagine all the feels. So my name's Deanna. I have an agency called Lux Digital with Sonal Brains. Um, her real name is Sonal Baines, but my phone wants to call her Sonal Brains, so that's what we root. Um, yeah, so, oh, okay. I'm going to start, I want to show you guys actually some pictures from a couple of years ago. These are pictures from my social media stream in the summer of 2013, sort of May through July. You see some really fun stuff. There's a picture from PDF, and my dog and my best friends, Amina, get a shout out to Amina, she's awesome, my dad, and emceeing a really fantastic event uh, for Social Media Week and uh, crowdfunding social entrepreneurship, and it was a blast. So. Who can tell me what is missing from this picture? Don't cheat if you know me. Dog. No, she's there. Ah. <laughs> Thanks, Barbara. Okay. Uh, so what's actually missing from this picture is that I was actually, during this time, spiraling down into my worst depressive episode that I had ever experienced in my life. I've always struggled with anxiety and depression, like any good New Yorker. Um, <laughs> But this was by far the worst, the worst one. I didn't necessarily want to kill myself, but if this was the pain that I was feeling, what is, that's what it meant to be on the planet, I didn't really want that either. And the dissonance that was created for me by what was actually happening in my life versus what I thought I should be publicly sharing with my community made my condition that much worse. And <laughs> I kind of lost my own train of thought. Um, I don't think necessarily that I'm alone in having that kind of experience. Uh, I think a lot of us have had that moment where it feels kind of like the, um, the, the difference between these, the, the public and the private self is, is very, very different. And we all perform different selves, and that's totally normal. This is a seminal text from the late 60s, early 60s. Um, we all present different ways of engaging with one another. It's how we tolerate each other. We learn that certain facets of our lives um, are, are presentable and okay for, for some parts and not okay for other parts. This is always what human beings have done, and that's cool. We're down with that. The problem is, is that the scale with which we're dealing with this now vis-a-vis -vis social media is kind of blowing our little monkey brains apart. We don't really have the capacity to deal with this and to um, keep our sanity intact while we're doing it. So I'm here to stage an intervention. <laughs> we need to talk, y'all. Five years ago, I stood on this stage and I told you that I believed that we had the power through social media to share different nuanced parts of ourselves, different um, little bits of bliss, the everyday minutia, the, the, the little points of pain that would paint these empathetic pictures and portraits of one another that would fundamentally shift how we change the world. I still believe that that's true. I still deeply believe that that's true. But five years on, I want to take a look at where we've come so far in the journey. Recently, there was a study by the Girl Scouts that showed that 74% of Girl Scouts thought that other girls made themselves look cooler than they actually are using social media. <laughs> there are so many things wrong with that that I don't even know where to begin. Uh, and, and my brain just tried to like unpack it. Um, the thing that stands out for me is that we are teaching children that inauthentic digital performance is okay and is normal and is just what you have to do to get on with life. And all of that can culminate and lead to experiences like that of Madison. Who knows the story of Madison here? I saw the ESPN story. Madison, star athlete, brilliant student, wonderful young woman. She died by suicide shocking her community because all many of her friends saw was her Instagram feed and her other social media feeds painting this portrait of a wonderful, well-adjusted life. No one really knew her struggle. Social media causes way more stress and anxiety than we could have ever predicted. 
<laughs> That's a good time. Um, we know that also Facebook uh, it uses social contagion, exper uh, emotional contagion experiments with us. We know that they try to test out whether we can actually influence each other's emotional states online. Spoiler alert, we can. Oh, it's so crazy. And then speaking of Facebook, also um, there's a, this set of, of tools and apps coming out that I call like the ambush tools. You've got things like the year in review uh, thing that came out with Facebook last year. And Facebook's paradigm of everything is awesome. They couldn't possibly imagine what your most popular posts from there, like why that might not be the best thing for you to be reviewing during the holidays. Uh, there's that. And also, who, it's so bad. Who loves time hop? Who's, who are my time hoppers? Okay, very few of you, good, because I hate time hop. I had to delete it off my phone, right? It's like, it's like you wake up in the morning and time hop's like, hey, I got something for you. And you're like, oh, cool. And you're like, oh, three years ago today, your uncle died. And you're like, oh. <laughs> So, you know, that, that, that weird kind of like let me dig up stuff for you and like throw it on you, ambush you emotionally, um, not okay. So I don't necessarily think that we have to focus exclusively on pain and grief and mourning and, you know, kind of all of these terrible things that happen. But I want there desperately to be room for it. Right now, there just isn't room for the whole spectrum of emotion that's happening online. Right now, the only ways for us to be vulnerable with one another are when something terrible happens in the world, when you lose a loved one, when something terrible happens kind of culture-wide, when you have black women and men being murdered by police, when you have queer and trans folk being persecuted and killed, when you have women losing their basic human rights to health and wellness. Those are incredibly important emotional flashpoints for us to come together, to grieve together, and to organize and take action from them. However, technology's answer to this uh, need for spectrum has been to contain um, and to draw lines and to put things into circles, lists, grids, groups. A friend of mine, my friend Anselm, who's sort of a genius hacker artist guy out in the Bay Area, wrote a rant about this to software developers. And he says in, a, in our work, our love lives, our sexual escapades, we aim for things to go smoothly and to be graceful, to slip past, slide over, not get caught, never get tangled. But nature doesn't get dirty, never has to be cleaned. Nature's nature is filthy. Everything in nature is already entangled. It could be that entanglement itself is the fundamental law of the universe, and the other things that we think of as fundamental are merely side effects. As technologists, we are obsessed with purity, with clean lines, with figuring out the most algorithmically poetic ways to handle our stuff. As people, we've become obsessed with advertising the best, most enviable versions of ourselves. All of this is leading us down this very dangerous path, this dangerous combination of, of alienation, and not just from each other, but from our own selves. And we are walking down a technological thrust into collective depressive dissonance. I don't think that a total focus on happiness either um, is the, the best possible outcome. I, I swear to God, every time one of those um, apps comes out to be like, oh, we're here to support your happiness, you know, God kills a kitten. I ha it happens. I know it. I also think that empathy, which is one of my favorite words, my favorite words in the entire world to use, it's what I use as a fundamental um, basis for our work at Lux, creating empathy. Empathy has finally reached buzzword overkill. Um, I kind of can't believe that, but Sam Gregory talked about this uh, at the Tribeca Film Festival this year from witness.org. And he said that empathy on its own can be meaningless. And what we also need is solidarity. I love solidarity, I love solidarity. But I also think that we need something more. And I've been trying to figure out since then, like what is it? What is it that's missing in the digital space for us? What is missing from our, our, our points of need? 
And I feel like it's at the intersection of these three things, at the intersection of authenticity, connection, and vulnerability. And what could that word be? Oh, vocabulary, oh, what could it be? So the, the closest that I could come up with was the idea of intimacy, appearing at the, the most vulnerable moments that we have and focusing on intimacy. And our entanglement as human beings, our messiness as human beings is what creates intimacy. But increasingly, with digital cultures focused on purity, we are being robbed of that collision experience that we so desperately need to be able to create intimacy for ourselves, with one another, with our own selves. We can no longer substitute the ambient awareness of what we have sharing with one another publicly for the absolute deep intimacy that we crave and that we need as human beings. Looking at how digital culture is structured, you can see um, the tools are built for, for silly human mammals who are uh, easily trained by positive reinforcement, right? Like intermittent positive reinforcement. We will push that button over and over and over Despite the frustration that social networking can bring us, despite the boredom and the everything else, we will push that button looking for the oxytocin hits and the dopamine hits, hoping that we pick one up in the middle of it because one time we got it and it felt really, really good. If we, if we are going to imagine the future of civic tech and the future of civics. As we, of people here in this room who are obsessed, absolutely obsessed with creating the conditions for which we can all do better in the world, we are going to have to embrace the messiness of humanity. Not just acknowledge it, not just see it, but embrace it, incorporate it, put it into the deepest parts of our core organizing, our platforms and the services that we're offering. We make jokes about this all the time. We know the humans are messed up, you know, oh, the humans are crazy, you know, and then we turn right around and we stick our fingers in our ears and we go la 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 la, hoping that some magic technological silver bullet will save us from the scariness of intimacy. It does not work that way. What would happen if we actually incorporated this moving forward? What would it look like for you to imagine all of the peopleness in your work? What if you took feelings like this and made them core and fundamental to all of our work together? What if we admitted that we don't have the answers and that that's okay, but just not being alone here on this nutty planet is a good enough place to start. Thank you.